So, hi, hi everyone. Hi Francesco, it's a pleasure hi. to be here with you today. For those who still don't know Giselle, Giselle was created because we strongly believe in Brazilian science. Our focus is working with 3D spheroids, providing reprodux reproducible and scalable solution for academics and also industry. One of the most exciting use of spheroids is for 3D bioprinting as building blocks. However, these methods for the analysis of their physical properties are still lacking. For which these, we developed uh, recently a biomechanical analysis based on metrological concepts in partnership with the National Institute of Metrology, Quality and Technology. But uh, we believe that the physical cytometer from side dynamics can be a useful and a widespread solution in the future for our work and uh, also for all that work with spheroids. I hope we you all enjoy our webinar today. Thank you again, Francesco. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Start sharing the screen. we can see yeah okay so sorry <laughs> no problem yeah can you see them yeah yeah okay so yeah i was okay now can you see them i was just introducing the company and who we are and now we can uh, shift to the reasons behind physical cytometry uh, could you confirm that you are seeing the slides? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I can oh. see them, yeah. Okay. So, um, when we work on 3D spheroids, and uh, most from, from the audience today is working with 3D cell culture, we can measure a lot of parameters. For example, we can me measure the dimension and the morphology with uh, microscopic uh, imaging techniques. We can also measure biochemicals, uh, so viability with functional as I say, we can also quantify um, the expression profile with different methods, okay? Uh, but so far there isn't a rapid and easy way to uh, quantify the physical parameters out of your uh, cell culture and weight is going to answer to this claim. Uh, in addition, the spheroid formation is a multi-step process, uh, so after an initial cell seeding, where you seed the cells in, in the well, uh, cells begin to aggregate each other. And after a period for the synthesis of the protein involved in the cell-cell junction, uh, they form a compact spheroid. So during this multi-step process, uh, I'd like to put the focus that also these objects are evolving from the physical point of view. Uh, and so it's meaningful and relevant also to measure their physical uh, features. Uh, if we look at the picture of the left that is taken from a paper, we see the images of spheroids that are acquired in Brightfield uh, at different time points. Uh, and there are basically two parameters you can use to quantify and to classify these spheroids. The cell city number and the culture days. Uh, as you can see, samples undergo a compaction phase passing from day one to day two, and they, later on they start increasing their size, but this object very quickly reached a plateau phase. So from day seven to day 13, uh, these spheroids don't increase so much in size, but they are getting darker. So probably something is changing, can be their weight, their thickness, 
their density, but we are not able to quantify this variation in a very easy and rapid way. Um, besides, biophysics compresses also biological relevance because, as you know, the size and the compactness of these spheroids influence also the diffusion gradients of oxygens and nutrients and may also alter the drug penetration. Okay, so in conclusion, for all these reasons, measuring physical parameters is definitely worth okay, the time and the effort. And this is the solution we are uh, proposing. Uh, it's called weight, it's a play on words. Uh, it's basically a, a cytometer, um, a lab weighting scale that simultaneously measure the weight, the mass density, and the size of sphere-like biological samples. The technology is microfluidic based and in, it relies on a couple gravimetric and dimensional analysis. This is our, our paper, so I don't want to overload too much of this uh, speech with technical details, but it entirely describes the method uh, on the basis of our device. And I can send you also by, uh, personally by email. So, long story short, uh, the device acts similarly to a flow cytometer. So it withdraws the sample suspension from an inlet tube with a peristaltic pump and drives the suspension of your spheroid, of your cells, inside this microfluidic chip. Individual samples are analyzed one by one by this bright field imaging setup while they are falling down only by gravity force across the field of view with the culture medium or the analysis buffer at rest. So samples are moving down, are falling down only by gravity force and the camera takes images every 100 milliseconds to the spheroid that is falling down. Takes images and converts the fall speed in mass density based on a, on a physical law. The software is also able to measure the size and in the end also calculate the weight. So uh, we have three outputs. Uh, the device is calibrated in terms of accuracy and precision with polystyrene bits as you do in flow cytometry. All the samples from 20 microns in diameter up to 500 microns, so from single cells, clusters, embryos, spheroids, organoids, can be analyzed. Mm. One of the most important features is this, uh, the circularity of the samples. So the system works very well with quite circular samples, can be single cells, spheroids, something like that. And we measure 10 times the same individual sample. Uh, so at the end, every spheroid is measured 10 times and the software extracts average value and standard deviation out of these 10 repetitions. Uh, weight represents a, a breakthrough. Uh, it promotes a, a paradigm shift in the existing context in biomedical research, let me say. So we are really familiar with this kind of workflow where we initially grow 3D cell culture and later on we expose the samples to drug solution and typically we evaluate the in vitro efficacy by measuring the variation in size or with in vitro viability assays. Okay. From now on uh, we can uh, bring additional insights in, in this context. So uh, mass density for instance is an index of the spheroid compaction, and it is related to the so-called maturation time in spheroid. And as regards drug testing, um, these data can also be used as uh, physical and also label-free outputs of in vitro efficacy. In particular, weight loss, density variation, and diameter shrinkage can be used as physical output, and we have demonstrated that, that they well matched with uh, results coming from in vitro viability say. This is the workflow. Uh, we start generating 3D cell culture as you prefer, as you usually do in your lab, and we ask researchers to transfer about 100 spheroids related to the same test condition in an inlet tube 
by resuspending them in our buffer that is a calibrated source solution in terms of viscosity and depth. And after that, the system, as I told you before, withdraw the, the suspension from the inlet tube and drives it inside the chip, where samples are analyzed one by one. If you look at the screen, I hope now uh, I will be lucky and the video is playing well, you will see a single spheroid that is moving across the field of view. So you have the software that is uh, recognizing the external borders of the spheroid. So it is, it is doing the approximation of the best circle that describes the uh, borders, the external borders of the spheroid. And it also measures the speed of this spheroid that is falling down only by gravity force. Okay? So this plot that you are seeing in, that you are seeing in the graph are expressing on the x-axis the, the time interval of your experiment, and on the y axis, you have the position covered by the spheroid during their fall uh, inside the chip. From the slope of these lines, you can measure the speed of your spheroid and the mass density. The elaboration of the data is done automatically by the software. So at the end, you will have raw data in Excel, spreadsheet file, and you can elaborate data as you prefer. We typically suggest to elaborate graph with box and whiskers plot to represent the data that are uh, kept and included inside the upper and lower quartile. The system measures also average and standard deviation, as I told you before. Uh, let's take a look at the major applications of this technology. I selected three evocative images uh, to make it uh, clear. Uh, so far, we have selected three applications. Basic research, so you can use this technology and the output to monitor what are the physical changing of your samples throughout the time of your experiment. So over time during the uh, cell uh, growth and the growth curve of your cells. So you can do cell growth monitoring and you can also standardize uh, your 3D cell culture. In addition, you can use these outputs, uh, as I told you, for drug testing. So you can correlate the results coming from in vitro viability assays after drug exposure with also our physical label free output can be weight loss due to drug cytotoxicity, diameter shrinkage, or variation in the mass density that is, and is related to the variation in, uh, in the compactness and the compaction also of the spheroid induced by drug. And last but not the least, also as a quality control, uh, as Leandra said before, uh, 3D spheroids. Uh, recently uh, are used as building blocks for 3D bioprinting and so this technology uh, can be used also to uh, add useful insights in the physics of these samples in the, their density, their size, their weight. So researchers are expected also to classify spheroids according to their physical parameters and identify what are the most suitable spheroids for the bioprinting. Okay, so now I have a couple of case studies uh, to showcase what we have already collected as biological results with our technologies. The first one uh, regards NK cells mediated uh, immunotherapy, and it is the result of our collaborations with a couple of immunologists here in Italy, and we have evaluated. Uh, the efficacy of this treatment approach in common rectal cancer spheroids from the physical point of view. This is the rationale of the study. First of all, we have executed the physical characterization of 3D spheroids composed of 
four different cell lines of colorectal cancer with weight cytometry. We have analyzed in the beginning what are the differences among the four different cell lines generating the spheroid. And after that, we have tried to match the results coming from weight with two well-known in vitro assays uh, for the analysis of spheroid that are cell titer glow from Promega. It is a measurement of the ATP content in the spheroid and the count of cell nuclei in one square millimeter area with confocal imaging. So it's a technique to measure the number of cells that are composing your 3D spheroid. It's an indirect method to evaluate the viability and the proliferation of your cell within the spheroid. And after that, the most important point, we evaluated what is the impact of the NK cells killing of the tumor cells composing the 3D spheroids from the physical point of view, so with our device. And we have tried also to correlate this data with uh, an in vitro viability assay, crystal violet, that detects what is the decrease in the fraction of living cells after drug exposure. And in the end, we have also checked the different infiltration rate of NK cells inside the spheroid according to the cell line composition of the spheroid. And we have found out, this is interesting, that NK cells as a different method of action according to the type of the spheroids they are infiltrating in. So, starting from the beginning, spheroids were, were generated with SW620, DLD1, HCT15, and HT29. And they were cultured in low ultra low attachment flat bottom microplates from Corning Life Science and they are analyzed after six days with bright field imaging. If we look at the images after a preliminary investigation with bright field imaging it seems that uh, spheroid of HT29 cells uh, show irregular and rough shape compared to the our free type of spheroid. And this preliminary data are also confirmed by data coming from our weight device. And what is really interesting is that although starting from the same cell CD number, different cell lines generate 3D spheroids with statistically significant differences in the physical parameters. If we look at the graph, we will see that HT29 creates spheroids with lower weight, diameter, and very heterogeneous density compared to the other free cell line. And so that's why they are consequently discarded for the rest of the study because we are evaluating NK cells that are infiltrated inside the spheroid. So we are selecting the most compact spheroid. So we decided that the three other cell line, SW620, DLD1, HCT15, are most suitable for the purpose of this study. If we look at the graph on the right related to the mass density, we see this trend, and it is very interesting because if we keep in mind this graph, you can see that we have ob obtained a similar trend when we also count the number of cells composing the spheroid. So we count the number of cells for an area of one millimeter square with confocal imaging. Uh, cells are labeled in green and you see that there is a direct correlation between the density measured with our device and the number of cells composing the spheroid. Also in that case, HT29 that have the lower density have also the lower number of cells. So we have composed by few cells compared to the other free cell lines and SW620 also in that case show the best, the best performances. And a similar trend is also maintained when we analyze uh, the ATP content with cell titer glow. Uh, HT29 spheroids are also less viable compared to the other three with SW620 that, are, that show uh, the highest uh, viability, so the highest ATP content. 
another uh, point of um, consideration for us is that if we look at the LD1 and HT, HCT15, they are composed more or less of the same number of cells. But if we look at the ATP content, we, we will see that the LD1 steroids have a higher ATP content. So they, are, they have a, a higher variability compared to HCT15. So we can do a lot of thoughts and consideration uh, about this data because in our experience, there is, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the 3D cell culture models. There are different protocols, different culture methods, and it's important to standardize the external condition to uh, standardize also the samples, the samples you are working with. Okay, so this is the next point. Uh, we evaluated the NK cells killing inside the CRC steroid with our device. So we have measured what is the effect of this killing in terms of weight, diameter, mass density, and we have correlated these results with an in vitro viability assay, the fourth graph, where we measure the decrease in the fraction of living cells. Uh, first, we grow the steroid and then we, for six days and afterwards, we had NK cells in ratio one to one compared to the number of tumor cells composing the spheroid. And we tested uh, two exposure time, six and 24 hours. Uh, and then we characterized the spheroids with, with our device. Uh, for both cell lines, we observed a statistically, a statistically significant decrease in the weight and in the size of your spheroids. You see for SW620 and the LD1, stati statistically significant decrease at six and 24 hours, both in weight and both in diameter. And these results match very well also with the decrease in the fraction of living cells uh, coming from the in vitro viability assay. So this means that NK cells are promoting cell death and this result is consistent with the results coming from our device. Differences arises when we look at the mass density plot. If we look, if we focus on SW620 steroid, we see a slight increase in mass density after 24 hours of exposure to NK cells compared to the positive control you see here. There is a slight increase in mass density after 24 hours of exposure. And this difference is statistically relevant in the LD1 steroid. So it means that we have a different behavior according to the cell line that compose the steroid. It seems that the addition of NK cells uh, promotes uh, an increase in mass density. And to further investigate the reason behind this increase in mass density, we performed confocal imaging on steroid with infiltrating NK cells that are labeled in green. And you can clearly observe that there's a significantly higher number of NK cells that could infiltrate in the LD1 steroids throughout the entire surface, the entire volume. While in SW620 uh, spheroid, NK cells are accumulated only in the peripheral zones. So these data might explain the differences in mass density that we, are, we have seen before. In, S, in SW620, we see only a slight increase in mass density because the infiltration rate is lower, while in the LD1, we have a uh, statistically significant rise because there is a higher infiltration rate. We are trying to correlate physical outputs to biological explanation of uh, the, the results we are, uh, we are um, looking at, okay? In addition, we also confirmed the infiltration of CRC spheroids with NK cells with flow cytometry. 
So we would like to effectively demonstrate that we have infiltrated NK cells in the LD1. And so we first stained external NK cells in green with CD55 antibody. And then we labeled deeply infiltrating NK cells with CD45 uh, antibody after dissociation. So CD56 and CD45. And these are the results coming from the plot. We see that the fraction of CD45 APC positive NK cells is significantly higher in the LD1 3926 compared to SW620 steroid. So what we are demonstrating is that it's, it's clear we have a higher number of infiltrating NK cells in the LD1 steroid. The second and last case study for today is a suggestion for everyone in the audience that is working on stem cell steroids. In this uh, case study, we, uh, we grow, we culture spheroids composed of keratinocytes for six days in AgriWell plate from stem cell technologies. And we analyzed with our device at different time points and during the growth curve, how these steroids change over time. Uh, we observed similar trends in weight and in size. So, uh, if we look at the first graph, first graph on the on the right, we see that passing also in that case, passing from day one to day two, we have a compaction. So it seems that steroid is uh, decreasing in size, and after that it, it starts growing, and we see a trend that is increasing. So um, after a compaction phase, the steroid is increasing in size, and we have a similar. Uh, trend also for the weight, probably because at the very early beginning during the compaction phase, some cells can die and after that they start to proliferate. What is really interesting is the trend in the mass density because it seems that we have the mass density that increases in the early beginning, probably because cells are forming a compact steroid and after that mass density start to decrease. And, to, and I'm very curious to hear your, your thoughts and your impressions because um, talking with, with our partners and researchers, it seems that uh, this decrease in mass density that occurs uh, as the time goes by can be uh, associated to the release of soluble factors or proteins in, of the ex extracellular matrix that can distance a little bit cells composing the spheroid. <laughs> so it can be um, an effect of the release of the soluble factors. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, we have reserved some time for the questions uh, and also for the discussion about the, the results we have, we have seen today. And you can contact also us uh, at our email. We, are, we hope also to hear your impression. And for everyone that is uh, unable to, to attend the meeting, we can, we can also send the recorded version. Thank you, Francesco, for your uh, presentation. And um, I think it's very important uh, to make sure the quality control of spheroids. In fact, uh, quality control of cell culture is an issue for several decades, and uh, this interferes on the results. You can not compare results of different groups, and uh, somehow this impair the, the development of science and also for therapeutic field. So it's very nice, I think it's very nice to um, measure some uh, parameters and uh, make sure that we are working in each bath of spheroids in the same way. 
and uh, like uh, from your uh, presentation, we can note uh, that we also can measure um, uh, some uh, physiological parameters uh, very important is for spheroids. We, uh, yeah, yeah so, sorry if I interrupt you. Yeah, no, no. We, the, um, the problem is that we are dealing with physical parameters that are really new. Uh, mm -hmm. Really new, not because they are novel, but because it's quite weird to, to, to measure them on biological samples. <laughs> so we are trying to, to give context and to give it biological explanation is, is what we are asked by researcher to the results we've demonstrated. Uh, and also okay. for the quality control, I think it is important because uh, most, most of the times we see we can measure their mechanical property by squeezing of the spheroid mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense we can also associate to the results we already collect some of our physical parameters that are I think important for your work. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because when you, when you think about a tissue engineer, uh, we have to consider physical parameters, yeah? You, you must to consider because we are working in building a tissue or even our organ, so the physical parameter is, is crucial for every tissue. But uh, when you work with also with a basic a science, scientific question, I think uh, people sometimes don't realize how it's important because it's not a monolayer anymore. It's a 3D construction. So we have cells interacting with each other, cells interacting with uh, the extracellular matrix. So physical parameter is a crucial issue too, even when you are not working directly with each tissue engineer and uh, bioprint. We, we have some questions here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the first one is from Michael. Uh, 3D cells don't like shear stress and can demonstrate stress related to genomics, proteomics, etc. What is control in your system? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question uh, that sometimes we are asked to, to answer. Um, working under physiological condition because we, we can uh, manage uh, the, the, the speed of the, of the cells of the steroids that are moving inside our microfluidic system acting on the peristaltic pump. So as you do with most of the microfluidic systems, you act on a peristaltic pump in order to manage what is the, what is the speed of the fluid. Uh, it is more or less the speed of a, of a flow cytometry, okay? Um, so we have not seen this, this shear stress on, uh, on, uh, on live samples. For example, we don't see disaggregation of the steroid while they mm -hmm. are moving down. Mm -hmm. uh, and also to be sincere, we have also validated the procedure for the fixed set sample. So we can also work as you do, for example, in flow cytometry when you do fixation and then immunofluorescence, also in our case we have validated the procedure for the fixation of the steroid and so we can work on fixed steroid and we can receive samples from all over the world uh, so uh, also due to covid 19s hard times we are collaborating overseas with a research group also from usa uh, i hope with also with leandra but also with uh, other groups uh, out of italy and working on fixed steroid is the best compromise to analyze samples over days. And in that sense, you, you can also do the, exclu the exclusion of this shear stress. Yeah. So uh, the other question is, what is the largest organoids that can be monitored? And as we have organoids up to one millimeter, <laughs> yeah, the brain organoids usually have. have uh, yeah, um, now the system works from 20 microns in diameter, so from single cells up to 500 microns. 
so organoids of medium size. We know that there are also groups that works on mature brain organoids. Mature gut organoids can be one, two, also three millimeters wide. And in that sense, we are hoping also to deliver uh, a new powerful uh, technology um, by the end of the next year that it is able to analyze also bigger samples. Mm -hmm. But up to now, we are able to analyze up to 500 microorganoids. Uh, so in other words, you can analyze the organoids, but uh, upstream in your differentiation process when we, they are still stem cell spheroids or not so differentiated uh, organoids. Yeah, I think the, the other issue about the organoids depends on the type of organoids, of course, but uh, usually they don't have a um, predefined shape. They are not spheroidal, okay? So I, I don't know if it is compromising the use of the physical cytometer. Yeah. Um, now the system works with sphere-like samples. So uh, the more circular your samples are, the better the system works. Mm -hmm. um, the system works very well with cells, with clusters, with embryos, with spheroids or spherical organoids. Uh, it's tricky for us now to analyze, for example, gut organoids because they have lumen inside, microvilli and strange shapes mm -hmm. uh, or differentiated brain organoids because they mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. uh, really far from being circular. Yeah. Uh, this is another line of the development for us that is developing, developing an algorithm that works on the image analysis software that is able to predict uh, the best approximation of this strange, let me say, shape. Mm -hmm. uh, so today we are able to measure spherical samples. And if you have an heterogeneous population in terms of morphology of your samples, the system is also able to set a cutoff. Mm -hmm. You can, let me say, refine ellipsoid that you have in your heterogeneous population from the spheroid. You can discard ellipsoid or all these samples that, have, that are not so circular, that can have disaggregated or weird shape ellipsoid from the spheroid population based on the standard deviation you will have in your data. Since you have that steroid are falling down, if they are not perfectly circular, this impact on the attrition forces that the steroid is receiving during its fall. And so you can discard based on the standard deviation. We have already set cutoff to select your samples based on the morphology, on the circularity. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so uh, they, they the research that make the question about organoidy only just to clarify that they, she, they she, he or she works with liver organoids. Um, the last questions, um, when you say a spheroid has formed, what parameters define a spheroid? How do you know a cell line from a spheroid on six day, for example, or rather, how would you distinguish between an uh, aggregate and the uh, ice spheroids? Yeah, this is a, a good question. So uh, before the analysis in our device, we do the checkup with bright spin imaging. This is the starting point. Uh, after that, we are, luck we are lucky because uh, if we have an heterogeneous suspension, and you are looking at it in our device, you will see that the spheroid is falling down. Mm -hmm. So if it is a spheroid, you will see always a sphere. Mm -hmm. If you have an aggregate, in some case, you will see that the aggregate is moving while it is falling down. And mm -hmm. so some, sometimes we see more like a, a disc, let me say, a discoidal shape, not only a perfect spheroid. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that case, you can discard the data. You can do it manually, or you can do it later on automatically by the, the software that uh, discard these kind of samples based on the standard deviation as we, we said before. If you have aggregate and not spheroid, 
what happened is that aggregate showed different fall speed according to the orientation they have while they, while they fall down because according to the orientation also the attrition forces are different and this impact on the fall speed and you will see higher standard deviation so in that sense you can discard aggregates from spheroid you can do it manually or automatically this is not a big deal but what it is surprising is that there is a lot more heterogeneity that we initially considered in the generally in the 3d cell culture we are working with mm, yeah yeah i see um yeah it's 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 rely this heterogeneity um the most cases rely on the method that you use to form the spheroids so uh, some methods um, uh, facilitated this, this organization of cells, others not. You, you also have uh, some uh, intrinsic capacity, uh, depends on the type of cell that you are working and the form the spheroids. And uh, the, in fact, the aggregates, uh, they are not stable. So you can see on your system, and uh, the research you can see when you when they manipulated the aggregates, they fall, they lose the cells and uh, it's not stable enough like uh, spheroids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. <laughs> Probably this is unexpected, but I know you can answer <laughs> very well uh, because uh, some. Uh, participant in the audience work on stem cells mm -hmm. so it would be also interesting because you have the expertise uh, Leandra is working on stem cells from several years um, and she works on adipose derived stem cells spheroids mm -hmm. uh, for the mainly for the cartilage and bone uh, regeneration okay yeah. and we know that stem cell spheroids from the stem cells to the let me say cartilage or bone progenitor undergo different variation. Uh, they can also produce different kind of uh, collagen and yeah. you can also discriminate based on the type of the collagen if stem cells are going to hypertrophy or mm -hmm. to the differentiation in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the line, in the lineage you are working with. Yeah. So uh, this is the, our, our challenge now. Uh, do you think that these differences in the phenotypic uh, features of the cells can also be translated in, let me say, variation in, in density or in physical, in physical values? Are you expecting, expecting to see physical differences in, let me say, hypertrophic spheroids or stem cell spheroids that are differentiating to another phenotype? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, in fact, when you work, when you work with a pro stem or progenitor cell, and uh, you stimulated for different different pathways of differentiations, the, the cells respond. But uh, we also have uh, you. Uh, how can I say that? You have the the typical components of extracellular matrix. For example, collagen type type two for cartilage, but uh, we also have other types of uh, collagen and uh, glycoproteins. So it's not uh, 100% uh, specific. Yeah, we, we detect, we show that using the secretome analysis from spheroids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have this, but I think it does not compromise the use of the spheroids. And uh, when a cell, uh, when a spheroids are committed to hypertrophic cartilage, they start to grow the quantity of collagen type 10 and decrease the other type of collagen. So it works like that. And uh, when you, you start to compromise to bone, um, they start to mineralize your extracellular matrix. And uh, we saw remarkable, remarkable difference when you perform our 
um, biomechanical as SA. So I think it's possible to, to see the semi or even more specific uh, difference using the physical cytometer, yeah. Because depend of the type of collagen, it interferes on the, the on the how cells can interact you know, on extracellular matri matrix, and uh, these in turn interferes with the physical properties of 3D cell culture for sure. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, we have um, one less, one more question. Were the sample is still alive after the analysis with the WH? It's possible to reanalyze the sample at different times. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, mm, the new version that is ready to be sold on the market at the end of this year. Um, the system is also able to work on, let me say, rare samples. So uh, you, 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 can, you can have 20 spheroids in your tube and be sure that at least 10 of these 20 spheroids will be analyzed. And this is not, uh, you cannot have it for granted because it's very difficult to work on rare samples. So um, yes, you can, when we work with live spheroid, the system analyze them and then you can collect them in uh, an, out, an outlet tube. Uh, in some case, we are asked to put them again in culture to analyze mm -hmm. them in, with, in our time point. In that case, we suggest to put the device, of course, under the, the flow cabinet, mm -hmm. so under the laminar hood, to works under sterile condition. Another suggestion from us to make it more easy to do is to prepare replicate. So to create more replicate of the same test condition in order that you, you work on replicate and you basically analyze different replicate at different time points of the same test condition. Otherwise, you need to recollect samples. But yeah, the system is able to collect the samples after the analysis. If they are live, uh, you can just put them, you know, in in your in your multi well plate again. Um, let let me say for for the system is able to analyze one test condition in about twenty minutes. So twenty minutes is the stress or the, the biophysical stress of your samples when they are out of the incubator. So it's not so much, and but, but that's why we we are, we suggest to to do replicate because you are sure not to insert also this variability in the results you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in each experiment you can organize uh, 100 spheroids, that, yeah. And uh, you can do these measurements and, uh, and the work yeah. of other spheroids, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, far we, we, so far we ask uh, 100 spheroid for every test condition, uh, but there are a lot of research groups that work with uh, a lower number of spheroid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we are uh, decreasing the number of, um, of requested spheroids to 20. Uh, mm -hmm. This is quite a good compromise. Yeah. Uh, and now we are working in that way. Due, could, due to COVID-19, we, we basically receive samples in our lab uh, and we offer a free demo test. Um, and if it is successful, we can decide to, to move on with on-purpose uh, uh, test. So we just run on-purpose test to, to gather data for a publication of the research group. This is a, a quite agile way to, <laughs> to collect data and publish, uh, you know. Uh, but the results that are coming out are really interesting. So we, we hope to, to share with you something else also in the in the next months especially on stem cell spheroids uh, we know there is this need to standardize and to physically characterize yeah yeah um so people are saying thank you for the webinar i would like to say thank you again and um
Thank I you think too for we, are, we are recording the webinar so uh, me and Francesco can share after that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some, yeah. Uh, some uh, attender asking for that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I think it was a wonderful time. And, uh, Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Thank you for the audience, uh, for the time of everyone. Uh, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.